Welcome into the On Enquirer podcast. Jeremy Warner, Derek Piper. Let's react to Illinois basketball, improving to 2 and 0 with an 86 48 route of UMKC. Going to be a little quicker pod today because we got to get to bed, maybe a beer or two before bed, and then uh, wake up early to cover Illinois against Purdue, a huge football game. But Derek, let's talk some hoops and another great night for Dane Danger. The third most talked about transfer of the offseason has made as big of an impact as anybody. Terrence Shannon was fantastic again tonight. We'll get to Matthew Meyer here in a little bit, but Danger just absolutely dominant. 20 points, 15 rebounds, five blocks. Biggest question was how do they replace Kofi Coburn? Talked about Coleman Hawkins, talked about all this versatility. Tonight, they had another dominant low post guy, Derek and Dane Danger. We'll see how it translates against bigger, better opponents. But you couldn't ask for anything more from Dane Danger. Two double doubles in back to back games. You just see the confidence continue to grow. And he's playing with great energy, the way he's getting on the glass. And you can see that seven foot four wingspan, some soft hands, and, and a guy that is really just seizing this opportunity to make his impact felt in college basketball. He's waited a long time for this. And the way that with each play that he makes, it seems like the confidence level goes up. And he was showing out tonight. I mean, he even did the he's too small thing and had Kofi laughing after that. He dunked on a dude or maybe twice. Uh, and the fallaway jump shot, I mean, he, he's definitely feeling it. Going to have to do it against better competition. But we can see why this guy was at one time ranked top 50 in the country when he committed to Baylor. So uh, you think back to last year, when you added Omar Payne and you added Dane Danger, two guys that were ranked top 50, you just needed one of them to really pan out. Omar didn't. Early indications right now that Dane looks pretty good, and he definitely benefited from going up against Kofi. And it sounds like they had some really good battles and that Dane gave him some problems. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see next week. Like, that's the fun part of this is you get to see how much of that offense translates, Derek. But what I think really translates is the intensity and the effort with which he is playing. You see Dane when he first got here, you know, he was out of shape, and he just kind of had this look of a guy that, are you going to need to coach effort a little bit, right? That has not been the case where Illinois has done a fantastic job of, of getting the most out of him because he is 100 miles an hour at all times and uses his body really well. He's barely had any fouls uh, in the first couple games. And, and what's impressed me as much as anything, I mean, he's obviously skilled with both hands offensively. Uh, he is great with his positioning and the use of that seven foot seven wingspan on defense. He's, he's got the low post things you need because no one else on this team really is a, a low post player. Uh, that helps replace Kofi Coburn. But defensively, he's more versatile th than Kofi, Kofi and, and could be even more impactful with the way he can use that length around the rim as a rim protector. Yeah, I know in talking to Jeff Alexander this offseason, he said, well, Dane doesn't have the size of Kofi and stature, like seven foot versus you know six nine. The fact is, like his reach is just as high as Kofi's was because of the wingspan is, is that much longer. And yeah, he had great position tonight, was able to go straight up on some drivers. Again, he's going to see some taller front court pieces, going to see some some better athletes. I mean, although that, that's not to say that Kansas City doesn't have some athleticism, but yeah, his defensive presence, and I think they gave probably Brad Underwood some confidence to play some, this lineup of him and Coleman a little bit more. Because Coleman, I mean, he can guard anybody, it seems like. And for Dane to to play the five and, and be able to, to be a, a paint presence defensively, you're not going to see him switch out on the perimeter a whole lot. You'll probably play drop coverage, but uh, – Hitting the glass, if you want to go big with that kind of a lineup, it's, it's really good. And then if you take Coleman off the floor, he's a guy that you can go get one in the put, in the paint as offensively. And then also, uh, yeah, on the glass is a, is a huge thing. I mean, that's a big storyline that we've been talking about throughout the offseason post-Kofi. And it's early, but yeah. Dane is uh, – showing some really good signs right now. Yeah, I think we've put every qualifier we can. It's early, <laughs> but it's it, it's it's the reason to be excited about Dane Danger right now. This game didn't start all that exciting. Illinois won for 18 to start this game, had 15 straight misses at one point. The shot selection is really poor so far when, when they don't run their kind of sets. Brad Underwood's letting them play a little free. We went away from that maybe in the second half, ran more for, for Dane in the, in the low post there. Um, but a guy who came in, Derek, and, and really – helped him kind of get over that hump and get some confidence was was Jade Naps And I wrote in my quick hits, man, it pays to have two top 50 guards come in the same class. Sky Clark got off to a, a little bit of struggles. Again, the foul trouble has hurt him getting into a rhythm. But Jade Neps comes in, hits back-to-back hit -back threes, had that great dice through the lane to, to finish at the rim. It's it's kind of like a, you know, Sky Clark, I get the, the – 
the hype about him, and he had a great second half. Finished with 10 points, five rebounds, two assists, no turns for him. But Jaden Epps, 13 points off the bench, three assists, zero turns. Both those guys pretty good defensively as well. Um, it's nice to have two talented league guards like that. You know they're going to go through their growing pains, Derek, but this was a nice improvement from them from game one. Yeah, absolutely. Jaden's a bucket. I mean, he he obviously showed that back-to-back threes. Terrence made an awesome pass to him in transition on the second one. I know we'll talk about Terrence with the five assists tonight as we go along, but uh, Underwood challenged Jaden and, and Sky both to be a little bit more aggressive and to have Jaden come out there uh, and look for a shot a little bit more, the weave through traffic and transition and then finish on the the left side with the right hand was a really good move. And uh, I think another thing that's really impressed is you heard throughout the offseason – had some some bumps in the road with decision making and, and just seeing the floor the right way and would he even play a whole lot on the ball versus Sky and, and Ty Rogers who's who's skilled, but Jaden seems in a, in a better place than than what we heard in the summer and uh, the fact that he had three assists I think he only had one turnover against Eastern no turnovers tonight is a good sign and he's just uh, he's still going to take some time to try to pick his spots and, and try to do the right things as a facilitator but you know, balance a gifted score. And uh, to your point about Sky, I mean, Sky rebounded the ball really well once again. Uh, I like that part of it. It's reminding me a little bit of Andres Felice yeah. where you're able to get a point guard who can rebound like that and then push it up the floor. I think we saw that pay off in the second half. Yeah, it's, it's a huge deal uh, to be able to dig down in there, get long rebounds off of threes and be able to start the break. And uh, he's still trying to find when to, to let it all loose offensively. You don't want him just completely – only looking for his shot. I know that he's trying to to play within that offense, but I think there's still even another level of aggression that Sky can get to and another level of comfort offensively. But the fact that he is dialed in on rebounding, uh, he had two steals as well. That was good to see. And no turnovers off of a, a game when he had five in the opener. What did you see offensively, Derek? This team – we figured they would need some time to get going offensively. Now they end up shooting almost 50%, made eight threes by the end of this game. Uh, but to start 0 for 12 from three, this team, when they try to go get their own, um, it's it's not pretty. It hasn't been pretty. They do miss Luke Goody shooting a little bit. And we'll get into Matthew Meyer here in a little bit. He forced a couple bad ones. I mean, he wasn't the only one. Uh, what do you think is, is their next step? Is it just time? Is it just gelling? Because uh, as a lot of fans know, the, the bigger tests are waiting in about a, actually a week from tonight. Yeah, I think the cohesion is still a work in progress and, and being able to have the ball movement, under, be, be patient because there's kind of that excitement of we're playing this new style, we're playing fast, we want to be aggressive, we have all these options. You know, there's not just play through the point guard, roll the big man, throw it in the Kofi, let's stand around and watch. It's, it's different guys being able to make plays, but – Matthew Meyer took some really bad shots. RJ forced some things early as well. Um, even Terrence went into traffic and threw one up that wasn't very good. And I think also you're seeing a team that still has question marks from three. I, I don't want to yeah. say this is a bad shooting team because yeah. I don't think it's going to be. They have a number of capable shot makers. How many knockdown shooters do they have? Luke is one of those. I think RJ can still be one of those. Uh, but there there is a little bit of a wonder about when you throw in freshmen, when you throw in some, some wings that – Terrence hasn't shot it great yet. I think he will as the season goes on. Obviously, Matt's been struggling. I, I think that's something that could be night in, night out, a question for for this team where opponents might say, we're going we're gonna to crash inside. We're going to try to shake away the rim for Terrence and make you shoot some threes. But you'll see a guy like Coleman pop up and make a bunch, and I think this team still has some other guys that could do that too. Yeah, that's a good thing. You've got a lot of guys who can shoot. Are they great shooters outside of Goody? Maybe not, but I think you got a lot of guys who can shoot 35% or above. But I agree with you. Like they need to do it within the flow of the offense. I don't think there's a lot of guys that are going to do this off the bounce. I think they're doing that a little bit too uh, too much. But the one thing I love about this team, Derek, is they're talented, but they play their butts off on defense. Like they are into it. Uh, their effort is outstanding. That's a great foundation, right? Like when you can play as hard as they are, on top of how talented they are. The offense usually takes some time. I, I think Brad Underwood's got to be really pretty happy outside of some other things. Um, but defensively and in their effort and intensity, doesn't seem like he's got to coach that up for the most part out of this team. Right, absolutely. And the fact is that when you have the the athleticism, how much 
area they can cover versus and then add it to the the effort is is really cool to see and like there was a moment where ty dives on the floor over in that corner uh it was a Jaden who maybe corralled the ball ty gets up gets fed from coleman and ends up throwing it down for a dunk and it was just a a high level of effort i know that he wants more and we're going to talk about it from matthew meyer defensively uh but for the most part you're you're seeing the the block shots you're seeing the the forcing turnovers uh, and that's going to play into getting out in transition and be able to run and some more easy baskets, which I know they're still Brad is still wanting more and more and more of that. They only had 10 fast break points tonight. So it's, it's about turning those turnovers into quick scores. Um, but yeah, defensively, they are very versatile and obviously can, can do a lot when they, they play with that effort. It's good to see. Uh, I really like Terrence Shannon's game tonight. He didn't shoot it well, uh, four for 12 from the field, one of five from three. Got to the free throw line seven times in the first half. Ended up with 14 points. It was Dane's second half. But I thought Terrence as a distributor was really good. I had, what, four of his five assists uh, in the first half. Only one turnover tonight after I think he had three in the last game. Forced it a little bit. He's just a really good basketball player. Um, and then Coleman Hawkins and R.J. Melendez. like Those guys didn't have great nights offensively. Maybe they didn't have the high impact plays of some of these other guys, but I just thought they were solid. Like they and they were fine being role players tonight. And I, I thought that's a sign of maturity for for both of those guys. I thought Coleman was great. I don't know how many hockey assists he had tonight, but it felt like he was creating a lot of space, moving the ball when some other guys weren't. And RJ, I think, has given great effort on defense so far this year. So uh, maybe not star roles for those guys tonight. We know they can be stars, but the fact that they had the maturity to, to be role players and not force a lot of things, I thought was a good sign. Yeah, absolutely. You, you want a guy like Coleman, who's as good as he is defensively, not just to tie his effort and his engagement into offense. I think I didn't have a problem with the fact I mean, he goes 0 for 3 from 3. He missed some good ones, some good looks, and I think you're not going to worry about that. We know that he's capable from the outside, but that he played within himself. He didn't try to say, okay, I got to get my, I get myself going. Uh, he was willing to, to be a facilitator, uh, made a couple nice passes, played good defense. Uh, RJ, two steals, just as long as uh, same with Coleman, and uh, RJ was engaged and locked in. So uh, that was that was really uh, a positive for sure uh, out of those guys, and uh, that's what you want out of some guys that have you know played a lot of basketball. Yeah, the turnovers tonight, you know, they had 11. Three of those were from Danger, who had the ball in his hands a lot. Three were from Sincere Harris, who kind of came back down. He did make t- – two threes, which was great to see from Sincere. But um, maybe tonight was about playing more in control. Uh, he's, he's trying to dunk on somebody, uh, but he's 0 for 4. Someone's going to get it. I don't know who it is, but someone's going to get it. Uh, so Monmouth better watch out because he's 0 for 4 on those attempts. Uh, let's bring up the question in the starting lineup right now, and, that, and that's Matthew Meyer. Um, and, and Brad Underwood, we asked him again tonight. This is a second straight game. Matthew Meyer's been benched for the last 15 minutes, Derek. And he looked, I thought, better physically tonight. It looked like he was maybe not winded. Uh, looked like he was moving a little bit better. But, man, his defense has been bad. He's getting beat off the dribble a lot. There's some effort things. He's getting caught on his heels. He did have two good plays. Uh, he made a three. Uh, I think it was Illinois' first three in rhythm shot. Um, and he also had the steal. Uh, and great finish uh, with the left hand kind of over his the back of his head. So uh, those were two good plays, but two or three four shots and two or three just really bad defensive possessions. So not a great sign, but I think Brad Underwood sending a message to his young guys, hey, if you don't play defense, you don't guard, you're not going to play. But at some point, they're probably going to need Matthew Meyer. I thought maybe get Matthew Meyer some minutes, get him some confidence, get him some rhythm. Brad Underwood chose to, to send a message, I guess, to the rest of his team and Meyer. With that. Yeah, we've wondered where he gets pulled early in the second half of the Eastern game, doesn't play again. Is this physically? Is it conditioning? Uh, I know that he had a lot of bad moments defensively in the Eastern game too, and then you see it happen again, and for Brad to go straight to he's got to be able to guard. That's him. I, I still think that physically he's not probably 100%. Now, now tonight he did that athletic finish off of the steal, and then, like you mentioned, the left-hand finish looked like the dude from Baylor because this is a guy that just what I remember watching is is all over the court plays with a ton of swagger confidence uh, can make shots and uh, defensively he's he's versatile I wouldn't say he's a great defender he's a versatile defender yes. and he is one that can create some turnovers he's going to gamble a lot like he's going to get out there uh, he's even up on his guy trying to swipe at the ball he's trying to to anticipate the passing lanes but he's getting out of position and then something I saw against Eastern I think you probably go back and look at the same thing tonight. He is playing a little too upright. And like you said, on his heels, 
uh, of getting, he's just getting blown by to the basket. And he had two fouls uh, there with nine minutes to go in the first half. His first one was off his own turnover. We got loose of the ball and then fouled by compounding mistakes. That was something that yep. you don't want to see. And I don't know. It's a guy that I'm with you. I would have rather seen him play in the second half, knowing that he needs to get in a rhythm offensively. He needs to see shots go in and game action. But you and I think they need him next week. Oh, I know they do. Right? Like, I know they, they need do. they need him next week. So I think it's really important for Matthew Meyer to get in some kind of rhythm, get some confidence. Like the fact that he got those two to go in, those two shots to go in. It's like, okay, he's gonna build something here. Then he fouls, right? Early in the second half, goes to the bench, three fouls, Brad Underwood doesn't bring him back. Right. At least there is another game before you go out there to play in Vegas. I just think for a guy that has been at such a disjointed offseason because of his back injury and uh, just the the issues of him not getting into full shape. And you're wondering, like, it's been two weeks, two months since he's been fully cleared. What's what's going on there is another underlying issue. But I think that I can also respect Brad taking kind of the big picture scope of we got to fix this now. If he is having an issue of trying to just turn it on and off yeah. or not not be fully bought in at both ends of the floor. So for him to say, you know, I understand we're going to Vegas next week. We got to fix this now at the forefront to say, if you're not going to guard, you're not going to play. You got to fix your mentality. And if we're going to have to take a lump or two early on, which this team might anyway, then it, it might be worth the the fixing of it on the front end. Um, and I, I understand the, the culture part of it and, and trying to fix him, his mentality. And Coy's saying he was a good defender at Baylor. Sometimes. Right, yeah. like there's some areas he wasn't very good as a defender. I know you've dived into that. Uh, yeah, the synergy numbers don't say that he was awesome. I, I think, and then sometimes those are flawed. Yeah. The synergy they don't tell you everything. I, I think, but mostly, when you look at those type of numbers, if you're you can be a a good defender on a bad team and not show up that well because if the other defenders around you are bad, then uh, it's not great. But if you're on a good defensive team, your defensive numbers should be pretty good. His were kind of average. I, I like I said, I. He's someone that is a versatile guy defensively. He can guard a lot of different players, but his consistency at that end has been elusive. And I think that even – I was even reading into some Scott Drew comments last year. Like, they thought he took a big stride forward last year defensively because he could switch on to point guards and do some good things. But in the past, they thought that he was, he was struggling at that end. So he's had some ups and downs. The good thing about Matthew Myers, you know he's got it in him. Consistency has eluded him throughout his career. It just hasn't been a great start. I think some of that is the injury coming back, feeling confident, feeling in shape. But at the same time, some of this stuff's effort, right? Like some of this stuff is focus and effort, and, and Brad Underwood certainly uh, wants to see more from that. So the good news is you've been pretty good with him, not with him struggling early on. If he's good, man, because this team is so talented. Like, that's the biggest thing, Derek. Watching these, this team, we knew it's going to take some time. The talent is apparent. And, and somebody asked, like, would Brad Underwood change his offense um, if, if Dane Danger keeps this up? The good news is you have so many answers. You have so many ways you can play. Like, you can play through Terrence Shannon getting downhill. You can play through two freshman guards who are really talented at times. You got RJ who can shoot, all these other guys that can shoot. Uh, and then you, now you have a low post option in Dane Danger who looks capable at this level of being a really good interior scorer. Like, that that's the best part about the versatility, the depth, and the talent is you have a lot of different answers you can go to when – Matthew Meyer struggles. If Matthew Meyer clicks it back into gear and becomes the player everyone thinks he can be, man, this team has so many options. Yeah, and that's a great thing when you're trying to, within a game, for Brad to be able to judge who's on tonight, who's not. I can plug based on my, my scheme, playing to the hot hand, which he did in the second half, kept giving Dane the ball and played lineups with Coleman and Dane together. Coleman has a lot of experience operating on that perimeter with post feeds and everything. I also thought Jaden did a really good job of getting the ball to Dane inside. But uh, also, based on matchup, if you want to exploit somebody who doesn't have the physicality at the five, then you throw Danger out there and you pound him in the post. And then I think also if you obviously have Zach Eady, if you have Hunter Dickinson, then you probably don't want to go that route. You would instead make those guys guard in the perimeter, which plays to Coleman's strength. So just being able to, to pick and choose different things. I think in general you don't want to – take away Coleman's freedom. I think he's at, he's at his best when he has an open lane, when yeah. he can operate on the perimeter and, and play and make. And then also you like when Terrence has an open lane as a driver too, but there's no doubt with Dane's productivity, his rebounding, he's going to be a factor too. It's just about being able to, to pick and choose 
what you want to do and, and who has it on a certain night. Yeah, and Coy followed up. We, would you guys start Danger over Matthew Meyer? It took us two games to get into the starting lineup conversation. I get it. Dane's been better. Um, I wouldn't mess with it right now. I wouldn't mess with Matthew. Try to get him some confidence early in a game. Uh, listen, I think you got more time to, to figure this all out. And if Meyer's not good to start a game, you switch it up. Put Ty Rogers in or you bring Danger in, whatever you want to do. They did run Danger and Hawkins a little more today. They ran with that lineup a little bit more in the second half once Meyer went to the bench. They did. I agree. I wouldn't change it up. And we know that Brad loves having a really quality second unit. Like when you gonna... scored 43 points tonight, 43 to seven bench points tonight. Yeah, that's awesome. And to be able to know that within the first, you know, after the first media, you might be bringing in Ty, Jaden and Dane. Like that's a really good trio to be able to sub right in there. So, uh, as time goes on, if he wants to continue to number one, send a message to Matt, or just if he's not getting what he wants, I understand. Uh, and again, it, it could depend on some matchups where you might face a two post type players uh, in a lot of size, which uh, Kansas City had a decent amount of it. But yeah, I think that you just, even though Dane, if he's not going to start, you could still play him like you did tonight, twenty three minutes, and and go with that Coleman Day lineup. So Trevion Williams role, right? Um, by the way, you just mentioned it, Ty, Dane, Jaden Epps. That's your bench. Like that, that that's your bench. Like sincere, we'll see what his role is going to be. I think he's a he's kind of the spot guy, right? When when you want some intensity, you need some effort, need some energy. I think he can be that this year. And then Goody, once he gets healthy, you'll see what he can do kind of coming into the middle of a season. But that's your eight. That that's your eight for this team. All right, before we get out of here and we appreciate you guys, if you've got a questions, maybe we'll get to a couple at the end. I thought Illinois put on a great ceremony tonight. The, the Big Ten banner raising, uh, the ring ceremony was fantastic. Um, to see Kofi back here again, to see Alfonso Plummer, DeMonte Williams is really cool. But, man, Trent Frazier had his night. Uh, Illinois, they they had Kofi come out. They had Alfonso Plummer come out. They had DeMonte Williams come out. And then they stopped, had a tribute video for Trent Frazier, and brought him out. And Brad Underwood and – uh, Josh Whitman were both tearing up and Tyler Cottingham kudos to him from a line I board. He, he told me that look, that felt like Trent's Jersey night since he's not going to get it. Brett Underwood confirmed that they wanted to give him because he doesn't have the criteria to, to fit in the jerseys unless Josh Whitman wanted to make that decision. I, I don't think he wants to make uh, an exception because then that opens it up for, for so many other people. But um that was pretty cool that they kind of gave Trent Frazier his jersey night. And boy, did this crowd kind of give their reciprocation. So that was a really cool night for what was a, a team that overcame a lot of adversity, Derek. Um, you know, new pieces around Kofi Coburn and came out with a Big Ten championship and a very memorable Big Ten season uh, for this program. Yeah, they're making their mark in the rafters. You know, when you look at this first window of Brad's tenure, first five years to have – Two banners up there, a Big Ten title, regular season, the Big Ten tournament title. I know they think that they should have another Big Ten regular season up there too, which I completely understand. And then two guys, you got one already up there in Io, and you're going to have Kofi's up there. And I know that Trent has a lot of things. He has, he has an argument. I know he's that, got the Kalan Garris argument. Doesn't yeah, he? he's got a good argument. Um, they I could make another exception by getting like a top – if you finish in the top 10 scoring of all time. Yeah. Uh, so if they wanted to do something like that, like when you are, are done with your career, they could put Trent Frazier and Kawan Garris up there. But uh, they're going to probably stick to their guns of what their yeah. criteria are. Because you got to have criteria at some point, right? Right, and I agree with that. I, I think that – and he's it's not going to change the way that he's remembered and beloved here. And, and the fact that he, he cares enough about this place to come back 13 hours one way um, – to to be here tonight and fly out again tomorrow to go back overseas. He's having a really good start to his professional career. It was cool to kind of get the the full circle feel of, of now we're kind of uh, a little bit away from that that era and, and know that they accomplished a lot. And it, it was I, I saw Brad crying. I saw like you said Josh, Jeff Alexander, Tyler. Like there was not many uh, dry eyes on that one in the Illini family. So. Uh, that was cool. I think it's a great motivating factor for this current team. A lot of new guys and understanding they got a, a standard to live up to and see how great teams are celebrated around here. There's a great crowd for yeah. uh, UMKC. for UMKC. No, yeah, it was it was fantastic. I thought it was really well done and, and a good touch by giving Trent that moment. You just go back like remember Trent with like that that haircut, that kind of faux hawk he had to what he became. I mean, he was a bucket getter. Didn't really give a lick about defense. Didn't commit to Brad Underwood, but they knew each other a little bit from Brad recruiting him at Stephen F. Austin. 
he sticks here, gets the extra COVID year, and what an impact he made on this program. DeMonte the same way. They had two losing seasons, Derek. Kofi comes in, Io matures, uh, and they turn into two banner-winning teams and, and the best team in the Big Ten the last three years. Those guys, they'll be remembered like Serge and Marcus Griffin, right? Like that, that That's the group that I think you got to remind them of is just they set the foundation for what was – a golden era of Illinois basketball in the 2000s. Trent Frazier and DeMonte Williams will forever be known for that. Io, like Frank Williams, Kofi, like some of these guys, uh, the legends took them to another level. Uh, but those guys are the ones who made Illinois basketball and, and set a foundation. Yeah, very well said. And the fact that Trent wasn't wanted by Miami, Florida, Florida State, pretty darn good point guard to be able to get out of the state of the Florida. And uh, yeah, for Brad to be able to keep him in that class when things were falling apart with Jeremiah leaving and Javon Pickett and whatnot. But yeah, no doubt to be able to where you had the realization in that EIU scrimmage and, and just the, all the losses you took early on and that, that it was going to be a really hard turnaround. And there was a lot of people talking about, you know, nationally is, is Illinois unrealistic about their, you know, their expectations or what this program is supposed to be. And those guys brought it back to where it's like, no, we can, compete in the Big Ten for the title every year. And while the NCAA tournament success needs to be heightened and taken another step forward, these guys gave this this place a chance. And I mean, look at the talent they're accruing because of the resurgence, because of what those guys did. And it's pretty amazing. I mean, Trent Frazier was a monster get for John Gross back then. Yeah. Right? Like a huge Just get. Two uh, years too late. Yeah, and I know they had some other really good talents in, in, in that class, but at that time, getting a guard of that caliber, now you get two top 50 guys. Like that. That's because of what Trent Frazier did. Io DeSumo, Kofi Coburn, and go on and on, Andres Fuis, all these guys. Um, so kudos to those guys for setting that foundation. It was just a, a really cool night uh, to be a part of. And I posted the video if you if you weren't here for the tribute. Uh, you can find that on our YouTube page as well. Well, Even I, Bruce got a shout out too. Yeah, and, and it was a really cool moment. Yeah, Thank you for bringing that up, Derek. Uh, Bruce comes back. I think it was a great time for him to come back because Illinois basketball is better. Yes. He had nine years at Kansas State. I think everyone appreciates Bruce for what he was. It was time to move on. Uh, but he had he's the coach of two Big Ten championship teams, right? And then, you know, goes to the best season Illinois has ever had uh, by record, by how far they got in the NCAA tournament. Don't know if they do that with Bill Self, right? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But Bruce Weber and his offense certainly was a great fit uh, for that team, got the most out of that team. Um, maybe some refs did him in <laughs> towards the end. But it was really cool for him to be honored, for Illinois to take time, Tim Sinclair to announce him. And he had his moment where he got a standing ovation. I thought that was great. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, in nine years removed from – Illinois basketball going downhill and it being revived under Brad Underwood. I thought it was a perfect time to do it. And I, I don't know how Bruce did on the broadcast. I'm going to have to go back and listen, but he certainly knows his basketball and certainly is a good coach and left his mark on this program. Yeah, he deserves it. And it was cool to see the standing O and hear the, the vintage Bruce yeah. out of the crowd. And yeah, I think that when we talk about uh, Bill Self too, and we kind of were discussing how would he be received if he came back, in like a Kansas home and home type of series. And when you when you feel like you have your guy at head coach, when you love your hire and you couldn't be happier and you, you're also at a place where the program is having this much success, you can forgive some past things, like whether it's Bruce not getting not capitalizing on the momentum off of 05 and everything and then Bill leaving you. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there were so many – there was such a great run there and he was the head coach of one of the most iconic teams in program history. Like you said, on paper, the most successful team in program history and he deserved that moment. So it's cool. To, it was cool to see him back. And I, even in the concourse at halftime, seeing fans just like, yeah, Bruce, great to see you back. Hey coach, how you doing? It was, it was just really cool. The human element of that is really cool. Yeah. Because everyone knows he's an A plus human. Um, so, so it was cool to see him back and, and to get that ovation. Yes. Let's, let's do that. Kansas, Illinois, home and home. It's time uh, for something like that. And if, if Bill Self and Brad Underwood is, as you asked Brad about, if they're talking about that. Let's get that done. All right. For Derek Piper, I'm Jeremy Warner. Thank you for listening to the Illini Enquirer podcast. Give us a like if you're watching us on the YouTube channel. Give us a follow there. Uh, really helps us out. We're going to try and do this for every game. 
Uh, but yes, they do let us sit courtside here for a little bit. We get kicked out every once in a while, but uh, and that usually <laughs> is the, the cutoff closing time. Yeah. You were usually pushing that, but, uh, Thank you for listening to the Atlanta Enquirer podcast. Give us a follow, rating, review wherever you get your podcasts. And check us out all weekend. It's a big day tomorrow for Illinois football, trying to take a massive step towards winning a Big Ten West championship against Purdue. Joey Wagner and I will be there covering that. It's a big recruiting weekend. If you haven't checked that out at Atlanta Enquirer, we got plenty more basketball content coming up. So everybody have a great night. Take care of each other. And Joey Wagner and I will talk to you tomorrow right here on the Atlanta Enquirer podcast.